Every army needs a barbarian. A man giant in stature and prowess, who could bellow war cries with a mighty voice and hoist a sword that could fell many enemies in a single swoop. In A Song of Ice and Fire, it only made sense that such a figure would emerge from the last hearth, one of the most unforgiving castles of the north. The loyalty of such an individual was difficult to earn, but equally as impossible to break. And the mere presence of such a titan harkened back to times of myth and legend, when humans seemed more akin to divine heroes and villains. For the northern forces, this bastion of savagery was the Great John Umber. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Exploring Fiction. Deriving his name from his size and personality, the Great John at first doubted the capabilities of his leader. In fact, he was the most vocal opposition to Rob Stark's newly inherited lordship. However, a man such as the Great John respected nothing if not a display of strength, and it took the loss of two fingers to cement his loyalty. But after the incident, the Great John was the most ardent supporter of the King in the North, both on and off the battlefield, making plain to all that beheld him the truth of his allegiance and the strength of his beliefs. Though he could do little to stop the trickery of the Red Wedding, the Great John followed his king to the end, and was most likely ashamed that he did not perish alongside him. His fervor and barbarism on behalf of the North were unmatched by any of his peers, placing him among the most ferocious fighters the kingdom had ever seen. So, who exactly is Great John Umber, and why is he such an interesting character? Let's explore. John Umber, nicknamed the Great John, was born to the son of Lord Horfrost Umber and his wife at the last hearth in an undetermined year. Little was explained of the Great John's childhood, or general past at all, but he was said to have both brothers and sisters. What's more, the Great John was also married, producing numerous sons and daughters, and chief among them was his son John, known as the Small John. At some point in his early adult life, the Great John inherited the seat of the last hearth, becoming the Lord of House Umber. John, as his name suggested, was most well known due to his size. He was seven feet tall and wider across the shoulders than even Hodor, and covered in rippling muscles. He was undoubtedly one of the strongest men in all of Westeros. His voice boomed in a deep bass, and he was uneasy in dishing out respect, waiting for suitors to earn it through action. The Great John cared little for fanciful things, sporting the rough brown garb and beard common for members of House Umber. Into battle, he wore mail and plate armor made for a giant such as he, and carried both a warhorn and a greatsword larger even than ice, the ceremonial blade of House Stark. His enemies quivered before him, and he championed his native north proudly. The Great John first appears in A Song of Ice and Fire in A Game of Thrones, as this very same north is pushed to the brink of war. Accompanied by his kin, he leads the soldiers of the Last Hearth to Winterfell, answering the call to banners of the acting Lord of the North, Rob Stark. All of the Young Wolf's bannermen are skeptical, testing Rob's boundaries and limits as a leader. The Great John is chief among them. He threatens to march back home lest he is put in a position of authority amongst Rob's men, making demands and attempting to goad and manipulate the boy into granting him more power. Rob challenges the brute, and the Great John draws his sword. But in a flash of fur and fury, the direwolf Grey Wind leaps across the hall and pounces on the Lord of the Last Hearth, biting off two fingers of the man's hand 
with razor-sharp teeth. Instead of growing angry or resentful, the Great John laughs through the pain, admitting his defeat and praising his new lord for his courage and resilience. From that point forth, the Great John becomes the greatest advocate for the blossoming Rob Stark. As the young wolf marches to war, the Great John is ever by his side as one of his closest supporters, along with Rob's mother Catelyn and his childhood friend Theon Greyjoy. The army halts at Moat Caelan, and Rob commands his force be split in two for strategic reasons. He debates giving command of the infantry to the Great John, but his mother dispels the idea due to Lord Umber's impulsive tendencies in battle. And so, while Lord Roos Bolton takes half of Rob's force, the young lord himself continues on his intended path south, and he is followed closely by the Great John. In the Battle of the Whispering Wood, John unleashes his titanic fury, leading the tide of Northmen to victory alongside the young wolf. He, along with Theon Greyjoy, even manages to subdue the renowned Sir Jaime Lannister and take the golden heir to the west as captive. The host continues on to River Run, and the Great John continues to fight fiercely for his home and for Rob performing prolific, yet somewhat unheralded, deeds of combat. But despite the success of the war effort, the North is dealt a crippling blow as the news of Lord Eddard Stark's execution reaches their ears. Like his brothers at arms, the Great John prays to the old gods over the death of Eddard, and he sits at Rob's side as the boy holds a grim war council. Rob's heart has hardened, though he displays more stoicism than grief in this harrowing hour. While some of Rob's advisors call for peace, the Great John instead rumbles for war. He towers above all, and is the first to declare Rob Stark King in the North. The other lords and ladies soon follow the example of the behemoth of the last hearth, altering the trajectory of the North's fate forever. The Great John remains ever at King Rob's side in A Clash of Kings. As the warband rests at River Run, the Great John commands friend and foe alike to show their respect to the King and the North, and makes divine claims like the Red Comet is a symbol of Northern vengeance, and the direwolves were sent to the Stark children by the old gods themselves. But when Rob finally departs on an offensive tirade through the Westerlands, the Great John joins him in many raids and battles, carving a path of conquest into the heart of Lannister territory. Much is the same in A Storm of Swords. The Lord of the Last Hearth informs his king of the supposed deaths of Bran and Rickon, striking Rob with guilt and grief which leads him to sleep with Jane Westerling. He marries the girl, breaking his word to the Freys, and losing their soldiers in the same fell swoop. The Great John clamors for Rob to take action against the deserters, or at least offer them his uncles in Rob's place. But the king in the north refuses. He acknowledges his transgression, and is content to bear the force of its consequences. Shortly after the Battle of the Blackwater across the continent of Westeros, the Great John returns with Rob to River Run, where they find Lady Catelyn has freed Sir Jaime Lannister, the North's most valuable captive, in an act of motherly grief. Lord Rickard Karstark, another of Rob's prestigious bannermen, is furious, though the Great John himself is surprisingly somewhat sympathetic to the Lady of Winterfell. Lord Rickard murders two other captives in an act of defiance, and Rob tasks the Great John with hanging the man's accomplices. Rob carries out justice against Lord Karstark himself. After quelling the northern traders, the Great John follows Rob toward the twins, leading the van in their march and planning to cause a diversion in Rob's planned recapture of Moat Caelan. But first, the king in the north and his army 
attend the wedding of Sir Edmure Tully and his bride Rosalind Frey, a matrimonial match created as a result of Rob's betrayal of his word. At the wedding, the Great John grows unfathomably drunk, singing, screaming, and carrying the bride off to her chambers to begin the bedding ceremony. But the Great John's debauchery at the wedding is no accident. In anticipation of the Red Wedding, multiple frays were tasked with ensuring the Great John grew incredibly drunk during the celebration so that he would be unable to defend himself and his king in the massacre to follow. Lord Umber drank enough wine to kill three humans of normal stature, but nevertheless, when the Red Wedding commences, he fights fiercely, killing multiple opponents and requiring eight more to finally hold him down. Despite his effort, though, the Great John has failed, for his king lies dead and his army is similarly put to the sword and torch in the bloodiest wedding in the history of Westeros. Though his son the Small John perishes, the Great John is forced to live as a captive, mulling over his shameful defeat. In A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons, the Great John remains a captive of the Freys, though his uncles stand on opposing ground as the North grows fractured with their unifying house in ruins. Throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, Lord John Umber stands as the utmost pillar of barbarism in the Seven Kingdoms, maybe as the only man capable of rivaling the wildlings in sheer ferocity. Just like the heroes and anti-heroes from the tales of old, the Great John gains his name and reputation from sheer strength and size. Such qualities also garner his respect. When he first answers the call to banners proposed by Rob Stark, the Great John doubts his young lord. He, like the other northern nobles, seeks to assert his dominance and test the limits of the young wolf, to see how far he can go and how much power he can grab under a new leader, who is sure to be cautious, naive, and overwhelmed. And while Rob might be in over his head, he does not crumble under the pressure of his bannermen, but instead exudes his authority. At Rob's command, Grey Wind darts forth and bites two fingers off the hand of the Great John, and in that lone action, Lord Umber's loyalty is won. Unlike the other lords, who search more for political literacy and social presence when searching for their leader, the Great John presents his sword to the one who displays fighting prowess. From that moment on, the Great John dutifully follows Rob Stark, putting his own physical attributes to use in countless battles and tasks. He is an adequate confidant and tactician, but a brutal and deadly fighter, and proves an invaluable asset to his king and kingdom. And when the Red Wedding occurs, and the king in the north is toppled from his non-existent throne, it takes eight men to subdue the Great John, who is drunk beyond the capacity of a man of normal size and temperament. He is left alive as a captive, though for men like Lord Umber, death is far more desirable. Surrounded by treachery, intrigue, and individuals with minds that are more potent than swords, the Great John is a refreshing reminder of the mythical beings of old. He lives for the fight and lives by the sword, doling out his respect based on one's ability in battle. He is brutal and unforgiving to his enemies, and gruff and straightforward to his friends. Yet, when the Great John makes his determination to follow the King in the North, he is the staunchest supporter of all. Though many like the Great John exist in fiction, very few there are in A Song of Ice and Fire, leading the Lord of the Last Hearth to tower over his peers in more than just physical height. The Great John Umber played not a major part in the Great Game of Thrones, but he was a dependable representative of the North, 
and so remains despite its fall from grace. He was the loudest amongst the young wolf's critics, but quickly became his most fiery defender. Through the War of the Five Kings and the Red Wedding, the Great John fought for his home and his king. Using the gift of his physical traits, the way his fellow lords and ladies used their shrewd minds and cunning hearts. Lord Umber seemed to belong more to the great legends of demigod heroes and mythical monsters, rather than the wilted world of modern Westeros. And for this he was both unique and dangerous. Great John Umber truly embodied a savage spirit. So, that's all for this video. Leave a comment with your thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new here, I'd love to have you. Visit my website russellawellsauthor.com for exclusive reviews, fiction, and more. And sign up for my mailing list for free, exclusive content. The links for both are in the description below. And, like always, I will see you next time.